The planets revolve around the sun, sort of like the hands of a clock. Always moving forward, tick follows, talk follows, tick. This here clock has been one that we've had in the family for about 50 years now. For most of the time, it's like this. Uh, the hands of the clock aren't moving forward, it isn't ticking. But sometimes at night, for whatever reason, the clock begins to tick again, and the hands do indeed move forward. Now, scientists have a lot of theories about how time works. Scientists like Isaac Newton believe that um, time is sort of like a straight line, that our fates are predetermined and uh, we have no power over our destiny, while scientists like Einstein believe that time is relative, that it can branch. But what most scientists agree upon is that we can't go um, back in time. We can only move forward. Well, at least uh, this seems to be the case most of the time. But sometimes, in our universe, for no explicable reason, we are indeed able to move the hands of the clock back. Tonight, I will be telling you of one such occurrence. It occurred to two scientists by the name of Egbert and Allen. Now, Egbert and Allen were two of the greatest scientists to ever live, and ever since they were boys, they were obsessed with the sky. Uh, they came from that age when the sky was still a place of mystery, where it still held a sense of wonder. And the two boys immediately became interested in science, and they were always coming up with flying devices, and you could always find them out in the uh, college um, park, flying their kites, or, or um, trying to make their own uh, airplanes. Well, anyways, eventually the U.S. government, um, they decided to work with them, and Egbert and Allen had a plan for an airplane that could fly quieter and faster than any airplane that had been made before. And the government finally agreed to fund the um, experiment. So, anyways, the two men um, were kind of not well off, and this experiment counted a lot for them. If the experiment failed, they were going to be without a penny in their pocket. But if it succeeded, uh, they wouldn't have to ever worry about money again. So the two men went off into the desert. I believe it was the deserts of California, but I don't really have any evidence of this. And Egbert and Allen were about to test their device. Well, Egbert stood there in the desert, and he, he looked out, and he said, Oh, it's funny that it should be here. It was right here, Alan, when I was a boy, where I, I used to play. R right over there in those rocks, I used to play cowboys and Indians. And then over there, we used to have mud ball fights. D do you remember that, Alan? And Alan said, Oh, yes, that was a long time ago, wasn't it, old man? And he... He, um, hit Egbert on the shoulder. Yes, said Egbert. It was a long time ago. Oh, sometimes I wish I could go back, he said. Well, said Alan, you know what they say. We can't go back. All we can do is make the most of what we have. Yes, said Egbert. Too bad. Sometimes I wish this universe would just break its rules once. Just let us all just go back and maybe change things. Maybe make things better. Well, at any rate, uh, is it all ready? Um, he knobbed his head. Yeah, yeah, it should be. And Egbert, he, he looked over at the other men who were, who were standing there. All right, we're going to make it fly. And um, Egbert, he walked over. Alan, I was thinking about it. But perhaps we shouldn't do the experiment today. Alan walked over. Why not? Well, well there's clouds all up in the sky, he said. And um, Alan, he looked up. What, afraid of a thunderstorm or something? Well, yes, said Egbert. I mean, we wouldn't want any electricity to, to mess with this equipment or anything like that. We, we wouldn't want to risk it, Alan said. Oh, there's only a few clouds up there. We'll, we'll be fine, Egbert. Egbert, he, he looked at Alan. I just have a bad feeling. I don't know why. And Alan, he said, Don't worry about it. It's just your imagination. You and I have never been superstitious people. We've always believed that everything has a reason to it. Yes, said Egbert, and damn those reasons. Damn them all to hell. Well, come on, said Egbert. The two of them walked into their machine, and 
Egbert sat down, and Alan sat down. As Egbert sat down, he, he looked over at a picture of his wife, and his mind went back to her, their little dingy apartment, uh, the cats running around outside. They, they could hear the screams of people out in the alleyways, and they didn't even want to imagine what those screams were. Most of their nights were sleepless, their, their children all go, grown up. And as Egbert looked at the picture, Alan said, All right, you ready? Egbert said, Yes. Turn the switch. Egbert and Alan, he, he turned the switch, and Egbert pressed a few buttons, and a bunch of numbers began to run across the screen. And the clock on the wall, it was just a little clock that was, was right into the wall, built right into the wall, it began to um, tick a little louder than Egbert uh, remembered it to tick, but he sat there and he said, All right, let her rip. And um, Egbert, he, he, um, he pulled the wheel, and Alan, he, he pulled another switch, and all at once they lifted up into the sky, just hovered upwards, and they began to fly up into the sky, and Egbert and Alan were soon soaring, just like birds, just like they always wanted when they were kids. And Egbert laughed, why, George, we've done it! We've done it, Alan! And Alan, he, he began to laugh, and if they had had champagne, I'm sure they would have drank it, even if they were flying. But anyways, as, as Egbert, he, um, he, um, he sat there, and he felt like this was the best moment of his life. He was a child again. All at once, they felt a bump. And they weren't sure what the bump was, but it was just, just this big bump that shuttered the whole machine. And Alan, he, he looked at Egbert. What was that? Egbert said, I don't know. And he, he began to, to press the uh, radio, and he, he tried to call for his team down below, but no one would answer. And as Egbert looked around, he realized that the sun was brighter, and, and the clouds seemed distant, and in fact the whole desert seemed almost different somehow. Not different in a way that you could notice, not different in a way like uh, there's a bush or, or there's a rock out of place, but different as in a different place entirely. I don't know how best to describe it, but Egbert and Alan felt this feeling, and as they flew, um, Alan, he said, What should we do, Egbert? I don't know, he said. Just fly around. We, we, we need the crew if, if we're going to make a landing. Well, anyways, Egbert and Alan flew around for a little while, and as they flew, Alan said, Egbert, look down there. And Egbert, he looked, and he saw the whole town there below them. Their hometown, Little Town, was there, and... The Egbert immediately noticed that it was different. It looked just like it had when they were kids. I, I don't believe it, said Egbert. That's the old schoolhouse. Alan, he looked over. Yes, and, and there's the old general store. And Egbert, he said, My lord, Alan, y you don't think. But just as they were thinking these thoughts, and, and just as they were becoming worried, suddenly they felt another big bump again. And all at once they, they seemed to be back. And... The sun was where it used to be, and the clouds were where they had used to be. And, um, Alan, he said, Well, we're back, I suppose. And, um, Egbert said, Yes, yes, um, pull the, the plane down, he said. Well, anyways, Alan, he, he did as Egbert told him, and they, they landed the plane. Where's the flying crew? said Alan. I don't know, said Egbert. They both got out, and they, they looked around. Well, said Egbert, just uh, put some tarps over the plane and we'll go into town and, and figure out what, what happened to the crew and, and where everything is. And Egbert, he began to walk forward and Alan said, well, What do you suppose happened to him? We weren't in the air that long. It could have been more than thirty minutes. And Egbert, he said, Well, I, I don't know. Maybe there was an emergency or something. Anyways, Egbert and Alan, they begin to walk back. Well, soon enough they arrived in town and as they walked, um, it, they began to notice immediately that something was different. For one thing, there was nobody on the streets. Everything was just sort of quiet. And as Egbert and Alan looked around, Egbert said, Look! And he, he pointed, and there seemed to be a red eye drawn on one of the brick walls. And Egbert, he said, I, I don't remember that being there. And Alan, he looked over. Yes, and I don't remember so many security cameras in this place. As they were standing there, suddenly a, a soldier came up. Halt! What are you all doing? He said. You know you're not supposed to be out in this town at this time. And Egbert, he said, Well, 
and he, he looked around. It was night, by the way. Um, it took them a little while to get back to the town, and, and Egbert, he said, Well, we apologize. We didn't know there was any, any curfew. We, we, we must have arrived in the round town. We're looking for Littleton. And the soldier said, Well, that's where you are. And um, Egbert said, No, it could, couldn't be. And the man said, Look, well, give me your names. And Egbert said, my name is uh, James Egbert, and uh, uh, this is Alan, uh, Royce Allen. And um, Alan, he, he took his hand, and the soldier shaked it. Well, you should have just told me. Uh, I forgot. Uh, I, forgive me. I, I know that you two are, are very much into our, our Majesty's work. And he said, well, y you all just go about your merry way. I, I apologize for disturbing you. Egbert and Alan. And he walked away, and Egbert said, dear me. He looked over, and there on a sign was written the words, End of the World. Well, said Egbert, seems like it's the end of all worlds, for things topsy-turvy. And, um, Egbert, he said, well, maybe if we get home, Alan, we'll, we'll be able to figure out what's going on here. Anyways, they walked back to their hotel, still in denial that anything could possibly be happening. And as they went up, they began to notice that the elevator was a little bit more luxurious than before. It was a glass elevator. And as they went up, they, they came to their room, and Egbert, he pulled out the key, and it just happened to work. Anyways, they walked in, and weren't they surprised to find that it was just this most luxurious room? There was a big picture on the wall, I, I believe it was one of Salvador Dali's, and a beautiful marble floor, and a, a beautiful chandelier. And, and as Egbert, he, he, he walked around, he said, Alan, th this isn't our home. And just then a woman came out. Egbert immediately recognized it as his wife. Egbert, she said, and she ran over and gave him a hug. Oh, I'm glad to see you home, but you told me you weren't going to be home from Africa for a mother month now. And Egbert, he said, What? And he, he looked over at Alan. Well, we weren't going to Africa. Oh, of course you were, she said. Well, you must have got home early. Here, I'll fix you some dinner. And she walked back, and Egbert said, Alan, I need to talk to you. And they walked over and they, they looked out the window. Listen, Alan, something must have went wrong with the experiment. And Alan said, no, it's, it's impossible. What, what do you think could have occurred? I don't know, said Egg, but, but I was thinking about it. You know, it's said that sometimes in this universe things happen and they don't make any sense. They just happen because they can. Alan, what if we were to f have fallen into one of these occurrences? One, one of these instances when the universe made a mistake? And Alan, he said, Oh, come on now. The universe doesn't make mistakes. Anyways, uh, Alan began to laugh, but uh, just at that moment, uh, the wife came back in. Well, I I've got some steak I in the stove. Wait some egg, but he said, Well, we've actually got to run. Uh, we we've got to go back to the desert. Uh, Oh, uh, th there's something we need to get, he said. W what are you talking about, said Janice. Uh, Never you mind, I'll, I'll be back home soon. And he gave her a kiss, and as they were about to head to the door, all at once the door opened on its own. And there walked in Egbert and Alan, who had got back from Africa a little earlier than they had been expecting to. Anyways, these two different Egbert and Alans looked at these two new Egbert and Alans, and the one Egbert dropped his suitcase and yelled, by George! And suddenly the two Egbert and Allens from, from our story ran at the other two and tried to attack them. But these Egbert and Allens easily pushed them down. And the one Egbert said, Honey, I, I know what this must be. What is it? she said. And she was just, her eyes were wide and she said, Oh, I'm frightened, Egbert. No, he said. These are spies. I bet you they're working for the Russians, he said. Uh, we'll call the police. Uh, they'll come here and they'll pick these men up. Uh, they, they must have been trying to infiltrate us, get, get some of our experiments or something. Anyways, um, uh, that Egbert, he, he picked up a phone and he called the police. Listen to me, said Egbert. Where are you? Uh, oh, we're, we're, we're a sort of you. Something's happened. We, we can't explain it. Something's gone wrong with the universe. And that Egbert said, you, you keep your mouth shut, spies. I, I know what you're trying to do. Kill our family, aren't you? Just because we make ourselves a living. Well, they'll, they'll throw you in the clink. They'll know what to do with you. They'll put the electric chair on you. The American way. 
And anyways, um, Egbert, he, he called the police, and the police arrived, and Egbert and Alan were sent to jail. And that is where we'll leave them until the next night. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen to them, do you? Uh, what, what is actually going on? What do you think? Anyways, uh, le leave me, let me know in the comments. And as always, sweet dreams and good night. Tonight, I'm going to continue the incredible true story of Egbert and Alan. When last we left Egbert and Alan, they had just created a flying device that allowed them to travel through time, and they had arrived in a future that was ruled over by a force known as the Red Eye. And anyways, they eventually got captured by the police, by themselves. It's, it's sort of a long story. But they were now in prison and being interrogated, but the police weren't able to figure out anything, and they'd been sentenced to life in prison. And as Egbert sat there in his chair, he began to explain to Alan exactly what had occurred. You see, Alan, this is what I believe happened, according to a bunch of the guards that I've talked to and a few of the prisoners. When we went back into time, we flew over the town of Littleton, and a photographer snapped a picture of us. Now, the U.S. government got their hands on that picture, and they figured out how to create a flying device, at least somewhat like that, giving them technology years ahead of their time. Anyways, this device and this picture should have allowed the U.S. to win the war with Nazi Germany. But instead of winning the war, it only made World War II uh, continue. It, it somehow must... What I think might have happened was that Adolf Hitler mimicked the technology that the U.S. government was uh, putting out. And now, instead of ending World War II, we are in a future where World War II is still going on. And Alan, he said, Oh, it's just too incredible to believe, Egbert. Do, do you really think this is what happened? And Egbert, he said, It's the only explanation that I can come up with. So now we've got to think of, of some way to get out of here. And Alan, he said, But how? I don't know, said Egbert, but if the universe got us into this mess, perhaps the universe will, will get us out of it. I have to hold fate, Alan. And for a while, all they could do was hold fate. And they, for a while, believed that maybe there was a chance, but as many nights passed, they began to worry that they were doomed. But one night they were sitting there, and, and suddenly a bunch of red lights began to flash through the prison. And suddenly a guard ran forward. To arms, to arms, yelled the man. The enemy is upon us. Every able-bodied man is given a gun. We're, we're out in war now. And suddenly the prisoners were being released and were being given guns of their own. And Egbert and Alan ran forwards to the, so the bars and he, Egbert extended his hand towards one of the guards. Please, said Egbert, let us go. We'll help you fight. And the guards said, oh no, not you two. You two might be spies, and you'll just join your, your little Axis army, he said. No, you're staying in there until higher authorities can decide what to do with you. Anyways, the guard ran forward, and Egbert, he, he fell down in his, in his cell, realizing that perhaps they didn't have a chance after all, and perhaps this wasn't their um, chance of escape. But anyways, as he was laying there, he, he suddenly heard a loud whistling noise, and almost instinctively, he, he grabbed hold of Alan, and he pushed him to the bars. And he said, cover your face. And then, all at once, a missile landed right by the wall of their jail cell and exploded. And, and the wall broke apart. And Egbert and Alan looked out, and they saw that they were free. And they both ran out of the jail cell. And all around them, there was fighting going on. And men were filing past them with guns. And Egbert uh, led Alan. Come on, he said. We've got to get back to the time machine. We've got to fix this. Anyways, Egbert began to lead him down the alleyways, and it seemed like the smoke was, was filling their mouths, and everywhere they looked there was smoke. And as Egbert, he, he looked into, the, uh, into the, uh, the great clouds of smoke, he, he suddenly saw a man with a long beard run past them. Judgment is upon us, yelled the man. The four horsemen are coming! The four horsemen! And the men ran past him, and Egbert, he said, uh, Come on. And suddenly they, a general appeared before them. You two! He said, you, you, you are Axis or Ally's side. 
And everybody said, Where are the allies? And the man looked at them. All right, give them a gun. We don't have time. Suddenly, Egbert and Alan were handed two guns, and Egbert um, and Alan realized they were going to be forced to walk with the soldiers. And they had a feeling that this army, even by the looks in this soldier's eyes, were marching to their deaths, and Egbert and Alan with them. And as they walked forward, suddenly planes began to fly through the sky, and machine gun fire went off, and the general yelled, Fire! Fire! And they began to fire their guns, and all around there was fire and smoke and gunfire. And Egbert looked, and he, he saw the general pass by him, and blood was dripping down his face. We're in hell, he said. And he looked over at Egbert. Something's happened. God has made a mistake or something, or, or some devil has caused this, he said. There's some devil who has caused this world. Some devil has made this place. We are in hell now because of, of whatever it was that did this to us. And the man, he, he ran past and Egbert stared with wide eyes of terror. And he, he grabbed hold of Alan. Down this alleyway, come on. And Egbert led him in. Alan, he said, Egbert, I've been shot. And Egbert looked over and indeed, Alan was, had drub dripping from his side. It's all right, Alan, he said. Come on, we're going to make it to the device. In any ways, they began to walk through the desert, and Egbert bandaged up Alan's wound, but Egbert didn't seem to be doing better, strangely enough. And indeed, his skin had turned pale white, and his eyes were all misty, and Egbert led him to the, the device. All right, come on. He dragged him up the stairs. All right, we're just going to mimic exactly what happened before. And Egbert, he, he grabbed hold of it, of the uh, controls. What if it doesn't work, Egbert? said Alan. What if we can't go back? We have to go back, he said. The universe wouldn't have left us here. There, there must be a way out. Anyways, Egbert began to fly, and he did everything that they'd done before. He, he flew at the exact speed, and he, um, he, he sat there trying to think of something else he could do. And then he saw the clouds in the sky, and he said, That's it. And he, he flew forward, and suddenly they felt a great bump, and Egbert saw the sun rise in front of them, and they found that they were in a completely different world from the one they were before. And Egbert, he, he dropped down onto the desert. All right, here's the plan, Alan, he said. I'm going to send up a radio signal to our flying device, and I can only hope that it'll scare them off. And anyways, Egbert, he, he began to wait for a second, and suddenly a flying device appeared in the sky, identical to the one they had. And Egbert, he, um, he sent up the radio signal, and it seemed that the flying device stopped in midair. And then suddenly it turned around and flew back in the sky, and then it disappeared. And Egbert, he fell down with relief. It's all right, Alan, he said, and he, he grabbed hold of him and he hugged him. It's all right. I, I think everything's going to be okay now. And Alan, he said, Egbert, I don't think I'm going to make it. And Egbert said, no, you can't give up yet. We're going to get out of this. I refuse to allow us to be things of the past, said Egbert. We're going to go to a better place, some place where we'll be welcomed. And Egbert, he, he grabbed hold of his device, and the device began to fly up, well, of the controls, and the device began to fly up into the air. And Egbert, he said, it's going to be all right, Egbert. It's going to be all right. And they flew up into the clouds and disappeared from this very reality. Anyways, we will now go to the Egbert and Alan that fleed from the radio signal. They were sitting in a diner and eating lunch, and Egbert said, well, the experiment was a success. The government is going to fund more money for our next experiment, said Egbert. Well, we've done a good job, Alan, he said. Yes, but you know, it's strange, Egbert. What do you think happened? I was looking at the, um, the information, the, the device, and it seemed that for a brief amount of time, the clock went from one o'clock to eleven o'clock. And Egbert, he said, Oh, I don't know. It's probably some electrical interference or something. Egbert, he, he seemed to be... Th I mean, Alan, he seemed to be thinking. Yes, but what about that radio signal? How do you explain that? And that bump? And Egbert, he said, Well, I'm sure it's fine. I've come to the conclusion, Alan, that everything in this universe has a logical and a simple explanation to it. I if we only just look for it. There is nothing in this world that can't be explained. That's the wonderful thing about our universe. Alan, he said. Well, I suppose so. But you know, I, I had a funny thought in my mind that maybe we traveled back in time or something. Hey, Bert, he said. I think you've been watching too many science fiction films. And they both laughed at this, but 
As Alan uh, lifted up his newspaper, he let out a gasp. Egbert, you might want to see this. Egbert, he walked forward and he looked at Alan's newspaper. And he saw a picture of their device. Only it was all wrong, because it said it had flown a couple of weeks before they had even tested the machine. And Egbert, he, he looked at the uh, newspaper picture and Alan looked at him. My goodness, he said. And Alan, he said, well, what do you think it is? Egbert, he said, I hope they're all right. I, I hope there's still hope for them. And Alan, he said, hey, Egbert, what are you talking about? I don't know what happened, said Alan, Egbert. I don't know how this could have occurred, Alan, and I, I don't think we ever will know. But I have this strange feeling, Alan, this very strange feeling that something big has happened in this universe. Something very, very big. And indeed, something very big has happened. But for now, I'm going to be returning this file to its proper place. And that is all for tonight. As always, sweet dreams and good night.